Hi. Uh, good evening. This is uh, Life Star with Sun. I'm the co-founder and the CEO of Evoy. Uh, we thought we would do a little bit of uh, Q&A for you today. Um, something new for us, especially live. We haven't really done that before. So we got uh, quite a few questions uh, up front. It's also possible to write questions underway, uh, right underneath um, the film or, or the video. So feel free to, free to do that and we'll try to pick it up. Um, I think uh, what we'll start with today uh, is to say a little bit about eBoy, um, where we come from, uh, our status and kind of where we're going uh, in the big lines. Um, Evoy had a bit of a funny start, you could say. We started uh, uh, with an idea in 2005. It was me and my father. We had uh, one of our uh, workshop uh, whiskey nights where we, uh, we think about new things, what to do, um, particularly around the ocean uh, where we both uh, work and, and love the, the sea. And uh, the idea came up for a boat that we wanted to put an electric motor on. Um, and we searched the market and we couldn't really find anything that suited our need. We wanted something with high speed and, and high torque. Um, we kept watching the market. Uh, there was a few vendors that came along, uh, a few suppliers, um, but most of them uh, stayed in the low output market. And uh, in 2017, we actually just decided that, well, we might as well just do it ourselves. We have a lot of the competency we need. We, we live in a town that has a lot of industry that's uh, connected to this, so uh, we decided to go for it. So uh, since then, we've come quite a way. Uh, in 2019, we put our first uh, boat on the water, uh, the Evoy one. Uh, it was uh, christened by the Prime Minister in 2019 in, in the August. And we did a run, uh, official world record run with the boat in about a year ago now. And we did 55 knots on that run unofficial because we couldn't get a hang, hand on uh, the timing equipment that uh, we needed to do it officially. So um, we'll see if we do another run to do it more official, but we, there's no rush for us on that. Um, today, we are at the point where we're taking the system, what went, went into Evoy 1. We tested it for a year, optimized it as good as we could, as good as we can, and uh, now it's uh, ready for delivery to, to customers. So. In fact, the first customer system goes out from our warehouse tomorrow. So that's, uh, that's a really important milestone for us, for us that we're actually quite proud of. Um, the system that we are delivering now, it's a typical um, inboard system. It has a motor that um, can do uh, 400 horsepower, so 300 kilowatts continuous. It's uh, 800 horsepower uh, at uh, peak which it can do for a minute or two, uh, maybe three. Um, and uh, the system that goes out now has 120 kilowatt hours, so it has a little bit bigger than the biggest Tesla. And um, this goes into a boat that's uh, the same size as the Evoy 1, uh, the same hole actually, so it's about 29 feet. And with this setup, uh, the boat will do around one hour or so in plane hole speed. Uh, in uh, five knot speed, you will do about 12 hours. And in three knot speed, you can go, well, probably our number shows about 48 hours. So it, the speed really means a lot. So some say, okay, this, this range is maybe not enough, but the, the fact is that for a lot of people, this range is already good enough for the way they use the boats today. Um, and this is also a heavy boat, keep in mind. Uh, the boat itself without our equipment in it was 2.4 tons. So um, there are opportunities there. Um, some of you might have noticed that we are working with a new demo boat. Um, we're not going out with any details on that here today. Um, but we are working with a new boat that will be probably considerably faster than the one we have today. So that's something that we're really looking forward to. Um, and uh, also, we have started working with uh, an outboard that some of you have seen. Um, we, um, it's, it's the reason why we started with the inboard was because it made sense, uh, because we could save a lot of weight um, going from inboard 
uh, diesel to inboard electric. Um, a typical Volvo Penta on D6 would weigh 650, 700 kilos around there. Um, and the electric motor uh, that we have weighs 150 kilos. So this means uh, actually we win just there, we win uh, uh, 500 kilos. So, and you take out the diesel tank, of course, and it, it means that you actually, there's a lot of uh, possibility to put in batteries. Um, so the weight difference isn't necessarily that bad. Um, and that's uh, a challenge when we go to outboard because you don't win as much weight. Um, you, you change the power head, okay, you can win a bit there. Uh, and you take out a gasoline tank potentially, but that doesn't necessarily weigh so much. So it, was, it made sense for us to start in um, the end where we could save the most weight. With regards to um, the outboard, um, we've had a few setbacks on that. Um, of course, like everyone else, um, we've had some issues with the COVID. Um, we, we're not gonna complain. It's, uh, we're luckier than most. We've been able to keep in business uh, most of the time, um, but of course, with quite a few delays on spare parts, or not spare parts, but our parts. Um, Another issue that some of you know uh, is that we had um, an agreement with uh, Evan Rood here uh, in Norway for sourcing the lower leg and of course uh, Evan Rood closed down in the end of March. Um, so that was uh, of course a quite a big setback for, for us. Uh, since then uh, we are happy to announce that we've made an agreement with uh, Uxa of Sweden um, they make uh, diesel outboards today with belts and belt drives on them. Um, so that's one of the options that we have that we're working with and, and we will be testing through the winter. Uh, but we're also working with one more option that has the more traditional um, shaft and, and gear. So we'll see how that plays out in, in the time that comes uh, forward. Um, and we're planning to have this to the market in, in Q2. Um, if all goes well. Um, other than that, um, we're, we're proud of where we are now. We're, we're about 11 people, uh, 12 in, in the company. Uh, and we're also hiring about um, 11 more as we speak. So it's, it's been uh, a busy uh, few weeks here where we've done uh, a lot of interviews. And the reason why we're doing this is just to pick up uh, the competence and, and uh, know-how in-house to be able to address the interest and the sales uh, and the reservations that we have. So it's, it's really about uh, for us now to, to ramp up the production and, and um, meet the market in a good way. With, with the regards to the rollout in the market, I, I wish I could deliver to everyone that wanted the system from us. Um, it's a bit of a challenge uh, because we have to ramp up, we have to certify things, things have to be proper order, sending to certain countries gives certain uh, challenges with uh, tax, certification. So it will take a little bit of time to get a product all over the world, but at least uh, the plan right now is to start in Norway and then continue to certain areas in Europe. And uh, I think we might have some questions around that, so I can, I can address that when we get that far. So um, I think that's the main body of uh, and a general little pull through of what Eway does. I think it's also important to mention, if you don't know this already, um, it's, it's good to know that uh, we we are uh, a technology company. We, we don't really uh, think that much about, uh, uh, we, we have the hardware, hardware in the bottom, but we have to remember that this, the software is gonna be really, really uh, the drive for us. We, we spend a lot of resources now on building up the software, um, and, and we're also working a lot on building the the ecosystem around the boat. So we're working with uh, apps, we're working with uh, user interface on screens, and we, we are working on some exciting things there that we can share with you as time goes on. So that's, that's a part of what we're doing that we're quite excited about. Okay, I think maybe we're getting closer to maybe starting with some questions. Um, and as I mentioned, feel free if you just came in, 
uh, feel free to put some more questions and, and we'll look into that. So um, we have a question from Anne-Marie. She has a question about what motivates you and what are your plans for 2021? Um, okay. What motivates me um, or us, I would say? Well, um, it's, it's important to, to uh, pinpoint and mention that uh, besides having a curiosity to finding and developing new things, um, I myself is, I'm, I'm, I'm quite driven by, um, what should you say, like I, I'm worried for um, the, the global warming, um, really worried. Um, I have two children, uh, two girls, they're five and eight, um, Amber and Fern, and uh, <clears throat> it really worries me uh, to see the changes that we have before us. It's, uh, it's, it's really something that needs to be addressed and it really needs to be addressed now. And <clears throat> this was definitely a motivation for us and for me when we started that here is, I, I can't think of any other way that I personally can make a bigger impact than co-found Evoy and make this work in a good way. So that's, <clears throat> that's going to be really important for me, but also for the team. I know this is really important for them. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's really a, a good motivation for us. Um, with regards to 2021, I think um, it's, it's the toughest part yet to come in many ways. Um, I think uh, Elon said it, actually, one of these uh, not very long ago. He said, uh, making, the machine that's, making the machine that builds the machine is 10, tar 10 times harder than building the machine itself. Um, and we're starting to realize and, and see that. So uh, making the production work, uh, ramping up the production, uh, automating the production, uh, getting the sales out, making sure that we have a good service and support system out there in, in Europe and in, in the world uh, on our own or with partners is going to be critical for us. So. Um, I think 2021 is going to be a lot about that, just uh, getting everything in order. Uh, we're already working with, uh, uh, with uh, getting systems in place in the company, uh, quality systems, uh, computer systems, ERP systems, and just to be ready to ramp up in a better way when we get a little bit further. So, uh, but of course, uh, we're going to start delivering to some pilot customers as well. Um, so we actually have sold out. Uh, batch one for the inboard and also batch one for uh, the outboard, um, which is really positive. Uh, so, so we're now continuing to work on the next deliveries so come, um, come fall time. Okay. Uh, Mark asks if we're planning to do motors around 24, 25 horsepower. Um, with regards to that, I would say not now. Um, and the main reason is that um, there's a couple things that's uh, interesting to know. One is um, we have to look at uh, what the rest of the market is doing. And there's quite a few uh, companies that actually can already source you a 25 or a 30 or a 20 or a 50 horsepower. So there's, there's already uh, quite a few that's working in that, in that area. Um, so, and there's another thing that's interesting to think about, and that's that um, uh, you have, the in Norway, we have a traditional uh, rule of thumb, and that's that um, uh, outboard costs about 1,000 kroners per, um, per um, horsepower. And what we see is um, that um, that is a kind of a linear upward thing the the advantage with building high output electric engines at least for high volume is that that linear one is much flatter so it means that you can build uh, higher output systems potentially with a lower price than gasoline or ice systems internal combustion systems um, without, uh, well, when you get to volume, of course. So there is um, 
they will take time to get there, but uh, the business plan makes sense when you look at it at long term to stay in, in the high output. Of course, it's extremely demanding. Um, if it wasn't, somebody else would have done this before us. Um, but um, we're now quite confident that we can uh, move into this market in, in a good way with, with good products. All right, we got a question from uh, Frank. Uh, any plans to expand into North America? Um, uh, with regards to that, um, thank you to all our friends in Canada, US, Mexico. Um, we have emails and phone calls every day. Uh, it's, it's awesome. It's really, really nice to see uh, how enthusiastic people are about the possibility of maybe be able to go fast with electric outboards uh, and there's so many lakes there's so many rivers there's so many places where it really really makes sense also on the coast to use electric um, but with regards to when we will be able to deliver there um, i think we will see the first systems potentially going there in 2022 but there's still a lot of work to do um, so it's, it's hard to be exact but um, I think if things go as we hope and plan, that we will see the first systems in, in North America in, in 2022. That's, that's uh, our goal to, to be able to do. Okay. There's a question about um, what size of boats do we recommend for our systems? Um, with regards to that, um, since the output from the, from the outboard is around 150 horsepower equivalent, uh, it would typically work quite well on a boat from 20 to 25 foot in a single installation. Um, in a dual installation, it could go fine up to 30 foot, I would say. That's um, around there. And for the inboard system, uh, in a single installation, it, it's typically the sweet spot is around 30 foot. So 25 to 30 foot is where uh, you have a boat that's big enough to carry the batteries in a good way, uh, but also small enough that you can get real nice power out of the system and, and nice speed and quite often quite good efficiency as well. And then, of course, when you pass 30 foot, um, it's quite natural to look at uh, dual systems, but it all depends on the boat because uh, uh, we... But the next boat that we're looking at is probably going to be um, the next demo boat that we're looking at is probably going to be around twice as energy efficient as Evo A1, and that's even without foils. So it just it just goes to show the possibilities there are around electric if you have really um, energy efficient boats. Um, and of course, yeah, we have we have dialogue with quite a few boat builders. That's also uh, looking into foils. So that's also really interesting things happening on that side. Okay. Um, what are the vision on supplying the system to commercial um, vessels? And are the engines AC or DC? Um, well, uh, the, the prices of the systems are naturally a little bit higher than what you would expect from diesel and what you would expect from gasoline. Um, and the reasons for that is, of course, we have fairly low volumes still, so that, that goes into it, but it's also a matter of um, the batteries. And on the battery side, uh, I would say the prices are coming down, but not as quickly as we maybe would have wanted. We see that the battery suppliers quite often instead of taking down the price, they um, quite often say, look, uh, we have a battery that's so and so many percent better uh, energy density and we want to try to keep the price. So, but there is, there is a balance there and, and we foresee not um, necessarily a big, uh, we don't think there is going to be a big drop in the prices. We think it's going to be gradually coming down because uh, if the batteries um, companies, uh, imagine if they, everyone knew that there would be a fantastic battery that came in two years and you could source it. Of course, you wouldn't buy anything for two years and all the battery producers would go bankrupt. So 
they are intensified or incentivized to keep it steadily improving just much like we're seeing on computer compressors on processors and and such um, and that brings me to the answer to the question uh, the reason why we are working mostly with the commercial market now is because the prices are uh, so that you need to have quite a few runtime hours per year to actually have a good ROI, so return on investment. So for people that solely buy the systems for um, economical reasons, which are quite a few or maybe even most, um, it makes sense to buy these systems if you run a lot of hours per year. So in Norway, we've looked at the numbers for fish farmers. Um, they typically run around five, 600 hours per year with their boats, um, while a private boat typically runs be between 50 and 100 hours. So there's, there's a lot of difference there. So that 10 times there uh, means a lot. So a typical commercial boat would typically have an ROI of uh, uh, between we've seen everything from one year to ten years so it's really really different depending on how much you use it and it's also highly dependent on the energy prices where you live so the gas prices and uh, electrical uh, prices so these things make sense um, yeah but of course uh, our goal in the long time run is that we want to uh, get our systems affordable enough that they are, you don't have to think twice about buying electric in front of um, internal combustion engines. Um, and we will get there. It just will take us a little bit of time. So uh, just keep, uh, keep patient. How much efficiency research is being made in the propellers? Well, um, we, uh, have focused um, mainly on the electrical side now we're a small company um, so we need to do some hard tough choices how to get development going how to spend our resources in the best possible way um, so we decided to source the mechanical uh, side what's outside the boat so to speak so the the lower legs and also the stern drives is from partners um, so that means that uh, they come with certain propellers um, that they have in stock. So right now we're actually using um, uh, traditional stock propellers. Um, we're looking at uh, quite a few things within this uh, area and it's something that we will focus more on in the future for sure. But it has not, the, the advantages going electric is already so great. Um, that we haven't spent much time on the propellers. Um, so it's, it's a matter of now just getting the systems as good as possible, getting the weight as low as possible. Uh, by winning 50 kilos or 100 kilos on the system or the batteries or the frequency converter or the motor or the system combined, that means more than if you can make the propeller one or two or three or four or five percent more efficient. But uh, believe me, this is something that we really want to uh, look into more for the future and will look into more for the future. I think that's the short story long. Will multiple outboard engines help on displacement? Yeah. Well, um, I'm not 100% sure, percent sure what um, that means um, or what's meant with the question, but um, when you put on um, multiple engine, what happens is that you increase the drag because you have more wet surface. You have, um, if you put on two outboards, um, that's both 150. That's not the same as having one engine that's 300 because you uh, increase the drag of the boat with two uh, lower units in the water. So um, that potentially could answer that question. I'm not sure. Maybe. Yeah, in uh, 20, two, 2008, I have a 2008 Ranger Set 520 bass boat. That sounds great. 
with an Everud 250, how hard would it be to convert this boat to an all-electric Evoy motor? Um, 25 foot uh, is a really nice size um, in many ways because you can use both the inboard and the outboard, but the bass boats are usually quite flat and usually with uh, outboards. Uh, and a 25 footer I think would still work quite nicely with uh, 150. Um, I'm not 100% sure what speeds we're talking about, but um, it, I think it would be a nice installation with, with the outboard. Of course, the battery that we have today for, for the outboard is um, one of the most energy dense batteries uh, in the market with uh, 164 watt hours per kilo. Um, so so we, we can actually, uh, with a battery pack that weighs around 360 kilos, we do uh, 60 kilowatt hours. Um, so it's, it's, it's not that bad when you throw out a normal gasoline like in, in this boat. I think uh, that's probably uh, two or 300 liters. So the insulation wouldn't actually be necessarily much heavier than the, the one that's there. So I, I think that would be a really, really nice boat actually for, for electric, for sure. And uh, it's something to also to say that uh, for us now that's gotten used to the Evoy one that's electric, it's, it's quite, uh, it's really weird going back to uh, gasoline or, or diesel. And it's, it's really not a transition you would like to do. Once you've gone electric, it's really, really hard to go back because uh, it just, just doesn't make sense uh, to listen to all that noise, to have all that maintenance, um, to have all that horrible uh, uh, fumes and smells. It's, uh, yeah, once you've gone electric, uh, you don't go back. So uh, that's, uh, that's for sure. Yeah, what's our long-term development sourcing plan for getting more energy dense batteries? Um, uh, as I shortly briefly mentioned before, um, to have a shortest possible way to market, um, we started sourcing uh, our parts worldwide from more or less off-the-shelf components, uh, and we built uh, some of the some of the power uh, components are of course built by ourselves, um, and we put this together in a good way, and then that goes also for the batteries. So if we were going to develop our own batteries that we mean is as safe as they should be, as energy dense as they should be, and uh, the good set certifications. Um, these, these are processes that quickly can take you at least two years or more. Um, so we decided to go a little bit different path. We, we found partners out there that we believe uh, holds the best batteries uh, for boats in the world and we source from them. Um, but we also um, have uh, plans or thoughts and ideas to, uh, with time, develop our, our own battery pack. I doubt that we will be building our own battery cells. I don't see that anytime soon. There's so much competition in that market, so I, I don't think that's natural for us. But we certainly will look into uh, building our own packs uh, with time. Um, potentially or probably I should say with partners um, that's that's also important to note about Evoy we uh, where we see good partnerships uh, that enhances us and the partner um, in a good way where it makes sense economically we quite often go that route so it's it's uh, we I don't know how many partners we have today. They're they're quite numerous, um, but it's important for us to connect to good people and of course uh, keep that um, uh, what should you say um, market um, uh, intel um, just so we know what's going outside our our own four walls. I, I think that's uh, a good strategy for us to to partner up uh, when we can. So we do that quite a lot. What is the mass of the standard battery? Could I replace dead stability ballast with battery? Yes, for sure. Um, so we know a lot of displacement boats. Uh, we don't particularly focus on displacement boats today, um, but our systems, at least the inboard, can definitely be 
um, used for that. Um, uh, for if you don't know, displacement boats are a slow going boat that doesn't plane. Um, so uh, for boats like that, uh, they quite often have uh, ballast to keep them down and to keep the writing moment uh, in, in a good way. So uh, using batteries as ballast just makes a lot of sense um, and something that's really natural really to, to do. And uh, yeah, our batteries are IP67 or higher. Um, so, and they're built and tested for the maritime environment. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's natural that you could use those batteries for those things. Uh, however, there's, there's one thing. Um, we, um, with the lithium ion batteries that's in the market today, there is always, you can never ever get the risk for thermal runaway to zero. Um, but of course we build in so many barriers that we possibly can uh, to avoid this. And, but if it should happen, it's really important to get that gas out quickly. So uh, if you were to take uh, batteries into a displacement hull boat and have it along the keel, for instance, it would be important to have uh, air circulation and get that air out there. And the batteries also uh, must be in an enclosed area so that you can get that air out from there. Uh, at least the way the batteries are, are built uh, today. Uh, there are some exceptions. So you could use LFP batteries, for instance, that has a little bit different characteristics, uh, but they're not so energy dense. So, but it, it kind of depends what you like. So our, our goal is to have the best batteries that we can have uh, in regards to safety and also in regards to energy density and price and just find that real good sweet spot where we find the best compromises and the best batteries for us and for the customers. So to confirm, um, 150 horsepower engine with a 60 kilowatt hours battery will be around 500 kilos. Um, well, the 100, uh, with regards to the weight of the outboard, um, it depends which route we choose with uh, two different mechanicals that we're testing. Um, so it will be, depending on what we choose, it will be either around 150 kilos or around 200 kilos. <coughs> and the battery itself uh, is around 360 uh, dry and 380 with, um, with, uh, with the cooling liquid. So both the battery and the motor, frequency converter and the charger is liquid cooled. And of course, setting up the system, it might, the three main components is the batteries, the motor, the frequency con controller, but there are also power management, there is uh, chargers, there's cables, there's cooling liquids, there's cooling pumps, there's heat exchangers, two of them. <coughs> so it's, the weight is a little more than just the main components itself. Um, but to answer the question, um, the weight of the system will probably be around 600 to 650 kilos around there. So for, for the outboard. I just need a little sip here. Okay. How would you provide guidance to marinas and boat clubs to prepare for electric boats? Great question. Um, well, um, as an example here in Flora, where we have our headquarters, uh, we see that um, between 70 and 80% of the boats are in marinas with um, uh, access to uh, electricity. And it's typically, here in Norway, it's 230 volts, uh, and it's uh, either 16 amps or 10 amps, usually that's available. <coughs> to charge on, on these, uh, if you had the whole uh, marina uh, electrified and everyone was charging at, at full rate um, the systems are usually not dimensioned for this today um, but if if you have this this transition will take some time uh, I wouldn't be too concerned because you can most normally use the systems that's in place there uh, and we also have safety systems and choices that you can do on our system to keep uh, the charging at a lower rate if you choose to do so. Um, so I, I think um, 
if you work in a marina um, or um, want to look what you can do for electricity for boats, it's going over the systems that you have, making sure that you have capacity to at least deliver uh, the amps that you need uh, to run uh, all of your spots at the right rate. Um, so it's, it's kind of doing those things. And there is a lack of standards today to how to address these issues. So um, maybe not rush it either, uh, because there will be, we are in uh, committees working on these uh, standards. So there are things happening on, on that side as well. So, um, and I think also for, for charging, uh, we are setting up our system so that we can also fast charge on DC. Normal outlet in your house is a AC uh, outlet. Um, and uh, um, the boat system, the boat the batteries themselves, they are um, DC. And then we have a frequency converter that takes the DC and changes it into AC. The motor itself is AC. Um, so if you're charging the boat from the dock, you have to take the AC and change it into DC um, to charge the boat. Um, so that's why you have uh, the charger on board for the AC. Um, so it makes sense in many marinas to actually, if you're going for high speed charging for boats just coming through or just want to ramp up to go back out again, then you need a, a quick DC charger, much like the ones that you have for cars. And <clears throat> that's what Evo is setting up for now. We're setting up our boats with uh, CCS charger spots and up to 150 kilowatt charging uh, on the boats. So uh, yeah, um, with 150 kilowatts, you can uh, charge from zero to 80 percent um, quite often in, in uh, half an hour or so, depending on the size of battery, of course, but around there. Do you have a general rule? Is it easier to replace old inboard or an outboard system? <clears throat> we have some uh, good rules of thumbs around retrofit. Of course, we, we think retrofit is going to be really important for us. Uh, boats last for a long, long time. If you take care of them, um, like the first plastic boats that was built are still pretty much exist. So if you take care of your boat, uh, they can last for a really, really long time. Uh, we have some fish farmers here close by that they're now on their fifth engine. Um, it's not that uncommon, actually. Of course, on the leisure boat side, it's, it's not that much. Um, so typically what's, what we see is that it, it is somewhat more, uh, re takes a bit more resources to do an inboard. And it's not necessarily because it's that much more work to put it in, but it's a lot of work to rip out the old one. Um, so, and everything, uh, an inboard leaves a really dirty uh, engine room. So there's a lot of washing, there's a lot of painting. And yeah, it, take, it takes a bit of time. Um, but if you have an inboard from before, you have a 25 uh, foot plus boat, it makes, quite often makes sense to go inboard anyway. Um, but uh, for sure, the, the outboard is easier to install if that uh, would suit your boat. So uh, for sure. Will fast charge shorten the battery life? Good question. Um, these are uh, depending on um, batteries, how, um, how much it affects it. Um, but in, in general, you can say it's the DOD. Uh, so depth of discharge has much more to say for the length, longevity of the batteries than how fast you charge it. But this is also, this is, it's, it's, if you move one of the lever, the other one goes down and up. So it's not, there's not one uh, direct answer to the question. So uh, as an example, you can see on our web pages, um, when you go into the configurator, you can see that uh, we have something called energy batteries and we have something called power batteries. Um, and these two have quite different characteristics around charging and how 
how they um, how they like that. So our um, our power batteries can can really charge fast, while uh, the energy batteries don't like it so much. But the energy batteries uh, really uh, has a much higher energy density. So today, uh, I hope in the future that these two will meet and that we don't have anything called energy or power batteries in the future, <clears throat> but that they simply, you just have really, really good batteries. Um, I suppose there is uh, one guy that has uh, batteries that's moving into that space now. Um, and. Uh, We'll see if we, uh, if anyone uh, uh, knows Elon, by the way, just uh, have him call me because I would really like to get my hands on that uh, 40, 4680 battery that he has. Oh, <laughs> what about using Tesla's new 4680 battery when they are available? <laughs> well, you see, uh, we're a small company uh, in Norway. We're not in the biggest place in the world. Um, We've talked to uh, Tesla as far as we could get here in Europe, and uh, and, and we haven't haven't gotten there yet. But um, uh, we we really really like the forty six eighty batteries, and I think I think most people don't really realize which an enormous game changer this is. This is uh, the battery that will show the world that not just electric cars are superior but you will also see these type of batteries, either from Tesla or others that will try to match them. These will really, really open up the mass market in regards to energy density, range, and price. So it's, it's, uh, it's really a fantastic ride that's uh, in front of us, and, and we can't wait to, to ride that wave the next 10 years, because uh, in 10 years, I don't think a lot of people will think two times about buying a combustion engine uh, for normal use, unless you have like uh, search and rescue, police, those things. Um, but of course, these things take time. We know that. <clears throat> Will you be able to run 12 volts, 24 volts DC equipment on the batteries or do you still need the lead battery well um, we um, even though we have 100 kilowatt hours in the boat or 200 or whichever um, you still need a 12 volt battery to boot up the system um, so the brain uh, would fry so to speak if you put it on 700 volts or 800 volts that we have in our systems uh, so you, you need to have a 12 volt system in the boat powering uh, the power components that runs the system and the pumps doesn't like uh, you have to have 12 volts or you really should have 12 volts or 24 volts for uh, a lot of components on board so you need to have uh, some 12 volts anyway so it just makes sense to to do that um, in the boat that we're delivering now the customer wanted uh, radars screens bow uh, thrusters, uh, there is a, a winch in the boat. So for that boat, it's still full electric. Um, it's heaters uh, and uh, a lot of high users. So in that boat, we have this installed what we call a DC-DC converter. And we actually have four kilowatt uh, in that boat. Uh, and we can also ramp that up if, if one likes. So you can really have quite high consumers in the boat, if you like, and that's something that we also can address and deliver. Okay, um, I think we've used the 45 minutes now that we were planning to do. Um, I would thank everyone for the fantastic, great questions. There's been a really uh, quite interesting to see what's come in. And um, I think this is also something that we will do uh, later on, uh, but have a look on our websites. There's a lot of information there. Uh, we also have our beta configurator on the websites. Uh, websites. Uh, we're working with them as we speak, so there will, we will increase the information around the configurator, so we'll give you more answers. Uh, so just keep following us, us on that. Um, yeah, and thank you so much for watching. It's been, been a pleasure. Thank you.